Hello everyone, and welcome to lecture number five on REST APIs and data serialization. Last time we talked about uh, proxies and caches, and um, what we saw was uh, we were looking, I guess, as an example at, at the Wikipedia architecture where there are all these uh, caching proxies in front of uh, the application servers. We saw that what those were doing were, were like any proxy, acting as an intermediary. So they were they're receiving requests and um, they w weren't able to um, by themselves uh, answer the request, but they knew who to ask for to get the response. Uh, that's what proxies do in general. A caching proxy um, not only knows where to go to get the answers to uh, requests, but it has its own store for recently given responses. So um, it can uh, give back the response immediately if it has seen that response recently rather than going back to the application and uh, you know putting load in the system. So a, a caching proxy layer in front of your application can uh, reduce response time and the effort required to handle those very popular pages that are requested over and over again. Okay, And that's why that layer is there. Okay, So um, you know this is generally useful if you have a service where a few popular documents are um, very popular and, and therefore you can handle those with the the uh, caching layer up front, and generally that's true in a lot of applications. HTTP, that uh, protocol for uh, web browsers uh, to interact with web servers, that protocol has built-in support for caching, and um, therefore we you know we often see caches in front of web servers, and um, we can also apply the pl apply those that same caching layer to uh, REST services, which we're going to be talking about today because those are also built on top of HTTP. So we've been talking throughout this class about services, and in your first homework you interacted with a service, or two different services really. Uh, one of those services you inter interacted with actually use a REST API. And so today we are going to um, talk a little bit more about those and um, give you a clear idea of, of, of how, not just how to use one, but how to design a REST API. Also we'll talk uh, a little bit about the alternatives here uh, briefly. Okay, but in general, uh, an application programming interface or API is a definition of, of th that uh, lets others use your code. Okay, so if your code is a library that you're you're actually um, giving to someone, if you're distributing the code itself, then there is an API, and that API is a list of public functions or classes that it provides. So there might be some details inside your library that are hidden from uh, the user. You'd want that to be the case to, for it to be easily used and for it to provide value. Uh, but uh, your your code library has to be usable through some by defining some public API. In the same uh, way, a software service can provide an API for other uh, other machines to make requests to it. Uh, and we call those requests remote procedure calls. So in this case, what we're talking about here, when we talk about networked APIs for, for services, um, think of an application that's running on a computer, um, you know, a service that's running continuously, responding to requests. Um, you know, if we're talking about a web server that is interacting with web browsers, the network level API is just the HTTP protocol. Like that's kind of a given. But in this case, we're talking about more than just that. We're talking about um, like deeper backend services that are not meant for a user to interact with, but for other code to interact with. So an example of that is, might be a database. So in homework one, you wrote code that interacted with the Elasticsearch database. Elasticsearch provides a REST API that allows you to, um, to interact with that database, like creating indexes, posting documents. It also has a, a REST API for doing queries. You have to search through the contents of the database. So that allows your code to interact with another uh, a software service, which of course has code, um, and uh, that, that that is done by defining a network API. And for that assignment, I asked you to look online at the documentation for um, Elasticsearch's API, and that documentation was describing a REST API. So in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and th those are used, you know. Sometimes APIs are public and they allow third parties to access your service. Like that was the case. 
this Elasticsearch example is, is kind of a public interface, uh, although in this case you actually were running your own Elasticsearch instance on, on your own virtual machine, or set of virtual machines in the cloud. Uh, like you didn't write the code for Elasticsearch, so in some sense it's a third-party uh, system. Uh, REST APIs also are defined for like third-party services that, that, that are totally outside your system. So for example, um, Twitter or Facebook, they have REST APIs that allow you as a programmer to do things programmatically on their system through that API. So if you want to write code that posts a tweet, uh, you can do that using the Twitter REST API. They're all, in addition to those um, to third-party interactions, they all, these kind of APIs are also used for different parts of your own application. If you have a multi-part application, and uh, that's called a service-oriented architecture or microservices architecture. And in the next lecture, I'll talk about that in more detail. Why you'd have why you'd break your your software into multiple services instead of just one, or maybe why you might just want to have one. But anyway, um, that's what we're assuming. We're assuming we have a service that that is running in a cloud or, or somewhere, and, and it wants to provide a network level API so that other code can interact with it. There, I have a list here of a few different styles of APIs. These are just, I mean, you know, you could define a network level API any way you want, but usually uh, they, they follow one of these styles. So um, if you took a networking class or, you know, a little bit about networking, um, you would know that you can open up a socket, whether TCP or UDP, to do communication between two machines, and that gives you kind of like raw uh, byte level, a byte level communication stream where you can send any data you want. The, a protocol is is like uh, defines the rules of that communication and defines what that uh, how you should interpret the messages that are sent back and forth. So when we talk about defining a network level API, in, sense what we're, in a sense, what we're defining is um, what is the format of messages that flow between uh, two different services or, or uh, between a client and a service? And um, as I said, usually those are defined to follow certain styles uh, just to make things easier. And the style we're going to be talking most about are REST APIs, which are built on top of HTTP. SOAP is an alternative, older version of uh, Style, an older style for network level APIs that also builds on top of HTTP, but it's less common now, so I'm not going to um, talk in detail about that. There also are a couple uh, popular protocols that don't build on top of HTTP, which are thrift and protocol buffers. Those are um, more efficient, and uh, so, so these are used at a lot of uh, big companies internally, like uh, I think Google uses or invented. I want to say protocol buffers, or was it thrift? One or the other, uh, for their own internal uh, APIs, because you know efficiency is really important if you have a huge scale system. And um, but it's harder to use. But these are less suited to uh, more more difficult to document for outside users to uh, use your your service. So for for third party APIs, in my experience, REST is pretty much um, is by far the most popular choice. A lot of internal APIs now are using GraphQL. There's some uh, that has some more advanced features. It's a little bit more complex to set up, I would say, than REST, and a little bit harder to explain. But um, so today we're going to talk about REST. But all of these, in principle, are different styles of defining network APIs. In addition to specifying uh, like what kinds of messages can flow back and forth, there are usually some form of authentication. By authentication, we mean some way for the service to know that the request is coming from uh, someone that they trust and should be allowed to do certain things. So we'll talk more in later lectures about authentication, though. Okay, but I want to start here by talking about HTTP a little bit. So if you've, if you've taken a networking class, um, a lot of this lecture might be, um, some of this lecture will be redundant, so you can kind of breeze through the parts that are um, repeated. But with HTTP, that's a it's an application layer protocol again that was designed for web browsers to interact with web servers, but it's been repurposed um, these days also for REST APIs for programs to access services over the network, because they you know fetching a document a browser fetching a document from a web server is is that kind of interaction that's very similar to um, a lot of the things that 
programs might need to do request, uh, with remote servers in terms of making a request and getting something back. Okay, so with HTTP, every request has a method, which is either get post or maybe put delete head or head. Uh, the most popular ones are get and post. And in addition, there's a URL or path. So uh, the method defines what you're doing to that URL. Get means you're, you're, get, you're fetching data. Post means that you're providing data. And put also means you're providing data, but in a slightly different way. So I'll, define, I'll talk later on about what the difference is between post and put. Delete means you're deleting data from the remote server. And head is a weird one that's like get, but it um, doesn't get the data itself. It just gets a metadata, like inf information about the data. And in response to every HTTP request, there's a, a response code, which is a number. There are like different four different classes of responses. The 200 level responses are, are successful responses, usually 200 OK. Um, 300 level responses are redirections. These are, usually, these are mostly relevant only for uh, web browsers. And then the 400 level responses are errors, and 500 level responses are also errors, but 400 level responses are errors that are like the client's fault, whereas 500 level errors are server errors. So for example, if you make a request and you didn't provide the correct authentication, like you're supposed to provide a password and you didn't provide the right password, you might get a 403 error, which is specifically defined by the HTTP protocol to mean forbidden, although your application can interpret it however it wants. 404 not found usually means that the URL you entered is bad, so that you're referring to a document that doesn't exist, and so on. Okay, so, so again, this is designed for uh, web browsers to interact with web servers to like surf the web, but it's been adapted um, nowadays to be used for programs to access services, services in general. <clears throat> so an example of that we might think of is a weather information service. So we, we have some, uh, some domain api.weather.com, which is providing allows others, other programs, to get information about the weather. Okay, and it does that by defining uh, a REST API, and in doing that, it basically defines what the structure of HTTP requests should be to get um, service, to get like to get responses that, that are useful. So, in particular, for the, in this case, to get weather uh, reports. So, this first part of the URL is the, just the domain. That's not part of the API because that could change depending on which, where the uh, service is running. So this indicates basically the location of the service, and then the rest is a has a path which is like a URL which you're familiar with from web browsing, and in this case the URL can be changed um, depending on who you are. So this this first part of the path, the API API says it's supposed to be your key which is like your essentially your user uh, user ID and password uh, all in one. So the service expects you to put in your key, your secret key here. Uh, and it'll check that when it gets the request to make sure that you're authorized to ask for the weather. And then um, there's another part of the path called forecast, which is telling the uh, server what information you're asking for. You're asking for a weather forecast. There's a question mark location equals this is a query parameter so it, it, you're adding to the URL information uh, an input to the request so specifically you're specifying what the location uh, you're asking for is San Francisco and URLs have to only allow certain characters spaces are not allowed in, in URLs so there's a URL encoding process that translates the space into a plus or alternatively I think it's percent sign two zero is, is the other alternative uh, transformation of space in addition, there are some standard HTTP headers. Um, the cache control header, we talked about caching last time. The client can actually specify, in this case, that they don't want any caching to be used. And um, it, the client is also specifying that they are they know how to decode the gzip compression. So if the server wants to use compression in the response, they can do that. Okay, but these are like details that are not super essential for uh, the REST API, and they're, they're things as a programmer you probably would not have to specify, and they would get automatically constructed by the HTTP library that you're using. The server in this case gives a response. In this, this example is a 200 OK response, so it thought that this, this request was acceptable. I guess um, 
this key should have actually had some kind of, we're assuming this had some kind of value in it. I, I just didn't type it out, what it would be. And um, the rest of this is, is following the HTTP protocol, which says that you can specify the content length to indicate how long the response body is and the content type. In this case, the content type is application slash JSON. So it's telling the, the client that the data being returned back is in the JSON format. We'll talk more about JSON in the second half of this lecture. But we see, we see down here some information about, um, about the forecast, weather forecast in San Francisco, right? Wind direction, uh, t the temperature, and, and so on. Okay. So in when, when designing REST APIs, there's one concept. I think most of it is pretty simple. Like you just have to define, um, there's certain, you have to define where your inputs go and where your outputs go in, in your uh, API. Because an API, just like any other, uh, a network API, just like a functional API in a, in a program, the main things you have to define are the actions that are possible and what, what the inputs could be and what the output is going to be. Okay, so that part is fairly straightforward, although for a particular application, you, you'll have to think about, you know, carefully about what you, th what you think your service should be doing, right? But the, the one concept in REST that's a little bit tricky is item potence because REST is using the HTTP protocol and the HTTP protocol expects has certain rules about what the different methods can do and those relate to item potence. So item, an item potent request uh, is one that can be repeated without changing the results. And the reason why this, this concept is built into the HTTP protocol is because it, of the support for proxying and caching that's built into HTTP. So, um, HTTP expects every every method, so every request that has a method that's not post, all those requests have to be item potent. What that means is that if there's a proxy or, or, or cache, if there's a proxy, it can actually repeat your request unless it's a post, and that shouldn't have any effect on the system. So running running a get request once or twice or three times shouldn't change the state of the system. Similarly, changing a put or a, or a delete request multiple times should not um, alter the state of the system. HTTP def built this rule into the protocol because that actually allows a scalable distributed system to be easier to build because you don't have to, um, like in a caching system or in a proxying system, if you, if you have uh, the possibility of fulfilling requests in multiple places, you could try to fulfill it in more than one place. And if it happens more than one, like you don't have to make sure that it only happens once. It's a little bit easier to implement those semantics than, than having requiring that it only executes once. So when you're defining a REST API, you have to keep in mind that idea of item potence and when you're choosing between put and post requests, because there's a difference between put and post, um, namely that post is, is, is not item potent, but put is item potent. So if your API, so with Elasticsearch, uh, an example you should be familiar with from the first homework is creating an Elasticsearch document. There's the API for this um, uses either put or post. So the API defines two different ways of doing a document creation. In both cases, you have to specify in the beginning of the path, the name of the index, and then underscore doc for document. So you're, you're adding a document to, the, to this index. But then if you're doing a put after that, um, after doc, you have to put in some kind of document ID that will define which document you're inserting. And then in the body, you have the document itself. Okay, so there's another way to create a document with Elasticsearch using post, where um, you do not specify document ID, and you, of course, you still, of course, specify the document in the body of the request. And both of these create documents, but the put document, the put request, will only create that document once even if, even if this request is repeated on the Elasticsearch server. Now, the way that it's able to, to, to implement that logic is because you're providing a document ID that can be used to um, find the element that's already there and replace it. So if there already is document 2345 that was inserted, you can replace it with this uh, document here. And therefore, running it twice doesn't really affect the system any differently than running it once. With this post request, there actually is a doc the document ID is is generated by the server, and so if you run this twice, it will um, affect the system the second time and actually create two copies of the document. Okay, 
So both of the, and you know, this API was, was defined correctly with an understanding of what the HTTP verbs, what the difference is between these two HTTP verbs, put and post. So this first one, it would, be, it would have been an error to define this first one as post, because in fact, if you look at the, the implementation of this, it is idempotent, so, you should, so you're, you're better off defining it as a put. Well, and similarly with the second one, if this was defined, if the code that implemented this stayed the same, yet the interface was changed to, to accept a put uh, with this uh, path, that would, that would actually not be following the HTTP protocol, and that would be an error. So um, the problem, you'd have bugs where, for example, if you inserted an HTTP proxy in between your client and your server, the, the proxy might expect that it could repeat this request, even though the client only generated it once, and therefore you'd have like duplicate data in your system, uh, even though you did, you, you know, the client, and that would surprise the client, and it would look like a bug. Okay, okay that's item potence. Um, so, just as an example, let's, let's to, to try to reinforce that idea. Let's let's imagine we're developing a social media application, and um, we're defining an API for it so that other people around the world can write programs that interact with our social media application. And um, I mean, we might also define an API, by the way, so that our own you know, other parts of our engineering team can interact with our back end, right? That, and we'll talk about that um, in the next lecture when we talk about how to break a big system into multiple pieces uh, with microservices. Uh, but anyway, if we're, if we're defining an API endpoint, so, you know, API has multiple different formats of requests and each, each one of those formats is called an endpoint. Um, if the action we're trying to define is deleting your, a user's latest post, we could define it like this, where we have uh, the delete verb, and then the path is user slash user ID slash feed slash post slash latest. Um, so we could define and implement it this way, but I would say that there's a problem with this, that this was a bad design. So I'm going to stop and think about why that's the case. Why is defining a delete API request with this uh, format wrong? Well, the reason is because delete is supposed to be idempotent by, by HTTP's rules, but this request, as we defined it, is not idempotent because the latest post will be different after we perform this once, right? So if we delete, if we run this once, that deletes the latest post. We run it again, like we, the user should be able to delete more than one, to be able to, to, to run this more than once and um, then and keep deleting the latest post where the, late, the definition of latest changes. And yet if, if a user runs this only once, but a proxy decides to repeat it because it sees it's a delete, delete method and therefore should be idempotent, um, the system will um, fail. Either, yeah, it'll end up deleting more than it should. Okay. And this, the service has no way of knowing whether um, a request coming in was generated once by a client and repeated by a proxy or um, generated twice by the client and therefore should correspond to two different deletion actions. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a solution to this problem which I guess I should have asked you to think of, which is you can you can make these you can make this API correctly use the delete method and, and be idempotent by by changing this definition to specify the post ID that you're deleting. So instead of having an API that lets you delete the latest post you can make the API delete a specific post by ID. Okay, so this you can run multiple times, as long as your post IDs are like you know kind of are randomly generated, like if they're kind of hash style or UUID style uh, IDs, uh, uh, not like you know ID one two three four where you might re delete four and then generate another different four. If these are unique IDs, then um, running this twice will uh, never do anything different than the first time. It, so it will, in fact, be idempotent. And that's a good API design, as opposed to the first I showed, which was a bad API design. Again, this is, this is we have these notions of good and bad because we're, we're using HTTP, which comes with its own um, rules for what you're supposed to do with the verbs and what the meaning of the verbs are, specifically with relation to idempotence. Okay. So, um, like I said, um, there are...
What happens if I decline that? Yeah. So services, REST is the most common style of API used by third-party services. So here's Twitter's um, documentation for developers, which shows their API. So they have, they show um, all the different endpoints. So an endpoint is a like pattern of requests that you can make that does something different. Like you can post a status, which I think in their terminology is a, t is a tweet. Um, you can delete a tweet um, and so on. You can, um, yeah, and if you click each one of these, there is more information about how it's used. So this is just like a text style documentation. So it, it tells you what the path should be and what it does. And there are a lot of details. So obviously Twitter is a very um, sophisticated service that's been around for a long time that has thousands of developers working on it. So, and so like their, their documentation is very long and there's a lot of different variations, a lot of documentation, different parameters that can go in here, as you can see here. Um, so to make it a little more clear, what they've done is created some examples, give you, giving you some examples. So these are, so curl is a command line tool you can use to make API requests. So that's a, a common way to um, specify to others, to give others an example of a request that you can make. And by the way, when you're defining a REST API, one of the cool things about this is that it's not tied to any particular language because what we're specifying is the format of messages that are going to go over the, over the network. So um, like the format is going to be HTTP, it's going to be an HTTP message, but that, that kind of message can be generated with really any language. Um, so so in, and even we even can interact with the REST API on the command line. So here's an example um, that you could, uh, you could run and it uses, so the URL is shown here. So that's a, that's an important part of the REST API where we're specifying the host name we're, that we're connecting to. This is actually the version number of their API. So they have, they have, they have a version to API so that, um, if you're making a request, you have to specify at the beginning what version of the API is that you're using so that if they update their, their version, their API to, to, to a new version, that's not compatible with the old versions. Um, you can, you can you can use a different URL to update to, to start using the newer version of the API, and one of the and then yeah the parameters include our, well, there's one parameter here in the in the query string which is this key value thing after the question mark, and there also are some headers that are, need to be included. There are a lot of headers here because of um, authentication, like this this uh, will. These have to be set to specific values um, that would identify the um, user. So that, that's actually a quite complicated part of this request. Um, and the response example response body that comes back is shown here. So all we did was create a um, status, yet there is... A lot that comes back, including information about the user, which is shown here. And the format of this data is JSON. We'll talk a little bit more about JSON later in the lecture. Yeah. So that's kind of a complicated API. Elasticsearch, of course, you probably have been looking at recently for homework one and it has, you know, a whole list of uh, API endpoints for doing things like creating indexes. And again, it's, they're defined in terms of an HTTP method and a path. And it, tell, it gives you a pattern here for the path showing this index thing can be changed depending on uh, what the name of the index is that you're creating in this case. And the rule, it gives rules about what, what could be listed here. So query parameters down here are additional things you could specify. Again, these come after a question mark in the request, um, in the path of the request. I guess there aren't any shown here, but yeah, here's an example where in addition to creating, um, in addition to, to issuing a put request to create an index, it also is providing an optional parameter in a query string after the question mark, wait for active shards equals two. So this is giving it more information about how to create the indexes. And if we look further up on wait for active shards, 
we see that this is an optional parameter that specifies the number of copies that have to be processed before the response uh, returns. Okay. Uh, you can browse through some of these other examples here, although this one right here is not working yet, but it will be soon. Uh, yep. Okay. So when we're defining a REST API, just like a functional API, we have to think about what the inputs are and what the outputs are, and what the different actions are. So we have different pl places where we can put our inputs in, in our REST API, and um, with the out, the output, and we have different choices for what the format of the output is, but the output is actually pretty straightforward, usually just some kind of um, body that, that's a JSON object. The inputs are a lot more varied with REST APIs because we have a choice of several different places where we can um, change the request. So uh, we can choose a method. So for example, we can have we can make a GET request, POST, PUT, or DELETE. Usually GET is for reading data, POST, PUT, and DELETE are for editing data. Uh, we have a path. Usually the path is used to identify the type of request, but there could also be parameters in there. So for example, here I have a, a, fict a fictional API that's get slash tweets slash, and then I have Connor for real, which is not part of the API specification, but that's a, an input, that's a username for which I am getting tweets, right? So uh, that's an example of putting an, an input into the path. So part of the path, the beginning part of the path specifies the action, so that's, that distinguishes between different endpoints, and but then another part of the path is an input. In addition, we can have query parameters, like I was showing you before. You know, after the path, you can have a question mark and put key value pairs for different. This is really good for optional parameters because you don't need to have these. Uh, whereas this this path thing here is um, would generally be required. So in this case, we're doing this. We have a search API that allows you to specify a start date and some search terms, as well as an API key here. Technically, the the headers are part of the input, but we normally don't use those for REST APIs and just let the standard HTTP headers be uh, used. Um, and the HTTP body is a useful place to put really big parameters, big inputs, uh, like if we're creating. Uh, in the case of Elasticsearch, if you were posting a document, like the text of the document went in, in, in a body that was a JSON format. If you have multiple things that you want to put in the body, you can use a JSON object to have different keys and values, lists, and basically anything you want. You have a lot of freedom there um, when you're creating a JSON object, which we'll see later. The output of your API is a combination of usually a status code, which is you know a number, it indicates success or failure, or you know you might have two, multiple different kinds of failures that have different numbers. You might also have multiple different kinds of successes that have different numbers. So, for example, when you are um, posting a document to Elasticsearch, I think it gives like a 201 er, uh, status code, which means found. Uh, so that's different than 200, and there might be cases where it gives 200 versus 201, depending on like if you're pu pu putting a document and it. Um, it, it replaces one that's there versus um, it creates a new. It might might give you a different response, although I, that would potentially not be allowed due to item potence, uh, depending on the method that you're using, whether it's post or put. Yeah, so technically you can modify the headers are available in the protocol, but those generally are not modified by REST APIs. Uh, we use the method, path, query parameters, and body of the input, body of the output, as well as the status code of the output. There are also usually some kind of, um, very often there's an a, there's some kind of API key or access token somewhere in the request that's part of the input, because usually APIs are not totally public and open for anyone to make requests. Usually you have to have some kind of like account with the system or prior relationship, or maybe it's an internal API that's meant for different parts of your system to interact with and you don't want hackers to get access to it. So there's some kind of, usually there's some kind of like password, which is an API key that's included. Um, this is the simplest way to authenticate with, by just having an extra input that specifies some kind of secret. Right? Um, so I want to ask, is this secure? Is it secure for your requests to have in them an API key and for that API key to be all that you need for your request to be trusted? 
It's a little bit tricky, right? So stop and think about that. On the one hand, this is kind of like a password because this is all you need for your request to be trusted by the service. Like for example, if we were um, interacting with Twitter and, and there was an API key that was used, the, the API key is all that you need to like do the actions of that user. If it was an a the API key for that user, like posting tweets or deleting tweets or, or changing follow relationships and things like that. So you don't want, you definitely want to keep that secure, but you're, you're putting this in the request and sending it over the network. So is it secure? Well, it, the answer is actually a little complicated. So in general, actually, it's more secure than you might think um, because generally you're making these requests over over an encrypted connection with HTTPS, S for secure. So if the, you know, every part of your HTTP request is actually encrypted when you're using HTTPS, even the, um, the, the method and the, and the URL. So this shouldn't be visible to anyone who's like observing your network traffic. However, it might show up often the, uh, for things that are, that are sensitive, it's better not to put them in the URL because you, URLs are often um, printed in internal logs when like, uh, like in access logs of servers to um, when they're tracking, like what kind of traffic is going on in a system. Yeah. Okay. So when you look at, uh, when you hear people talk and write about REST APIs, they often talk about RESTful and non-RESTful API designs. So with REST, what we're saying is like that by definition, what REST is, it's an API. It's a, it's a way of defining a networked API that uses HTTP. That's not the only requirement, but it kind of is. It's the main requirement. To make it really RESTful and, and to, to really call it a REST API, it should be using, um, it should really be obeying the spirit of, a, of, of HTTP by using the paths to represent resources or data objects. Okay, so you have you you define your API so that different paths represent different data elements in your system, and um, get will read data, put and post will modify the data, and delete will delete that data. Um, so a RESTful API is designed around different data resources um, are, are usually what you see. Now. The problem with that is that it's actually difficult to represent arbitrary actions in REST. So, you know, a networked API might, you might want to define something that doesn't necessarily read or modify data, but does some other action that of course might, might have some effect on data, but isn't directly um, like getting or, or, or providing data, right? And it's difficult to make that fit the REST style. So for example, if you're creating a, if you're de designing a messaging app, you might have to define a, a, an endpoint that creates a message. So a user on a smartphone writes a message, right? Um, one way to define this might be to have a post request that posts to slash inbox slash create message. And by doing this, we're, we kind of, we're defining a create message action. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a message. So, so we define an endpoint like this. This kind of this is acceptable, but it's not restful because it's it's acceptable in the sense that it it, it obeys the the fact that post is not is not expected to be item potent. So this does follow that rule. If it was put slash inbox slash create message, that would be totally wrong. This is acceptable, but it's not considered restful because the path is not representing a resource. So create message is not a re, a, a data object in the system. Okay, so. To make this restful, um, it would be better to rewrite this to um, for the, to make the paths refer to resources. So we don't want, yeah, to be restful, we, we want the only verb in the API endpoint to be the HTTP verb or method, and for the path to represent some kind of an object or noun. So create message is an action, a verb, not a noun. And, and post in the sense, um, is redundant with create message. So it's not in the, uh, it's not really in a restful style. To make it restful, we can retain post, but change the path to be slash inbox slash message to, to make it a resource or noun. So we're posting a message. Um, and we also could even better make it a put if we provide a message ID. So in this case, we're putting a, a specific message ID into the, into the inbox. Um, 
And so now you know you know you'll notice in the second two cases, the paths refer to 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 data in the system, and the second one, the last one especially, because uh, it refers to a specific data element by ID, and it uses an idempotent operation, which is better. Okay. So uh, I have a few slides here on. Um, different data serialization methods, uh, which you may have seen. If you have seen, you can go through these quickly. Uh, JSON is the JavaScript object notation. It's a way of, of serializing data that was in, uh, introduced in JavaScript for uh, objects in JavaScript. And these are the most common format returned by used in REST APIs. Um, you know, so basically these allow for lists and dictionaries I guess they use the term object but you could think I prefer to think of them as dictionaries uh, but that's the same thing so you have a key and value combination and there's an arbitrary amount of nesting that's possible there are also are basic types like numbers uh, booleans null strings so, so like there's a difference between this 30 here it that is not inside of quotes if it was inside quotes it would be different it would be a string in this case it's an integer um, but so but J JavaScript is it's a way of representing data as a string because JavaScript, of course, so JavaScript source code is a, is is a string, and to represent data in um, a source code file, you need a way to represent data as a string. So similarly, HTTP responses are um, are are like arrays of data of bytes, which which you can think encode with with characters and make strings, and therefore, if you want to represent data in a message. Um, you have to have some ordering of bits, of bytes to uh, represent that data. That's called serialization, and and JSON's a way to do that. Okay, so um, what JSON defines is a is a data graph. I mean, you can think of it as a graph. I'm not sure how helpful that is, but um, that shows the nesting. Like at, here at the highest level, we have a list that has two objects inside, which have different keys and values, and we have a key, a, a list inside one of the underneath one of the keys, and so on. Uh, there was an alternative to that called XML, which was developed earlier, which has a similar, like, st similar in the sense that it's another data serialization format. It um, allows arbitrary nesting. It's actually a little bit more flexible. Like, it ha it's more, it gives you more choices on how to encode things because it has attributes in addition to, um, although, I guess it's different. It, it doesn't have dictionaries, but it has, um, you can use elements to create things, pairs that are like dictionaries, I guess. Anyway, and uh, so every node has uh, could have can have key value pairs like this, which are called attributes. Like person has name John, age thirty. That could have also been represented alternatively internally with a ta with a tag inside. Like here we have um, every person. This person has a cars uh, element, which has a list inside of, of uh, elements. So it's a, it's a textual format for data. Actually, H, this probably looks to you um, like HTML because HTML is actually a type of XML. Um, yeah. So yeah, just, it has slightly different rules for, for how you can store things that, than JSON does. That's the same idea. With XML, you also get a data graph. The difference is that at each node in the graph, you can have attributes, which are key value pairs. So here we have a person whose name is John, age is 30, and then we have other elements below, which you see here. There's a cars node, which has then three things underneath it, car. Um, it doesn't have an, like a native uh, notion of a dictionary that can have arbitrary things inside of it, I guess, like JSON does. But you can mimic that with, um, with nodes that have uh, two elements, one for the key and one for the value. But so in general, the general concept here is serialization. Um, what that means, so serial, obviously, when we talk about serialization, we mean putting things in, in an order, first to last, and sequentially, right? So computer memory it, it, it is a place where you need to do serialization because computer memory is, is a big array, right? There's a start and there's an end, and there's like there are locations in between. Um, disks are also like that, right? Whenever we have, we we're st whenever we store things with computers, we have like an ordering of the data, right? Uh, messages that are sent over network have a beginning and an end. Files have have a, have a beginning and end, right? They they all use the same. I mean, it's kind of it's almost um, built in 
but we do have to stop and think about it because that's not it didn't have to be that way i guess it doesn't but in general like most of the data that we work with on computers is is in some kind of like an array like uh segment and we have to, but the data we store usually is more is more complex than just one array so we have to figure out ways to translate from complex structures into like just a stream of bytes an array right so this we have we might have a complex data structure like this that is like a tree structure but we want to somehow translate that into a sequence of characters that represent that data that uh, can be decoded into this in memory and it can be stored and also in this case can be read by human one of the things that's different about json and xml compared to other data serialization formats is that they are human readable so they they they, they use text to represent data which is uh, useful now by using text what it means is that uh, the actual file itself has zeros and ones bytes which i'm showing here in hexadecimal format every one of those um every group of in this case uh four bits is translated into a character using a uh, text encoding which is utf-8 or uh, ascii uh, or the kind of compatible with the basic characters so um this sequence of zeros and ones that um which are shown in hex translate to these characters which are a serialization of a complex data structure that is not just an array but something that has a tree-like structure okay. now serialization for simple structures is you know fairly straightforward you just have to choose some rules for for serializing and deserializing where it gets complex is when we have references so for example and you know computer programs often in memory the way computers deal with the references is, is usually with pointers uh, if you have a structure in memory with pointers or references and you want to you want you want to store it on disk or you want to um, uh, send it over the network to someone else you need to have some way to, to re represent those references okay so here's an example where we have two people in a json object and they both have the same hometown right so in this case i have repeated the information about the evanston object twice whereas what you might want to do is uh represent it once so this is an inefficiency we had in our serialization because we have repeated data that should have been a reference that, that both of these could refer to the same copy so sim when we have references the an even worse problem in addition to inefficiency could could be could be uh when you have circular references the uh trying to actually print them out would not just be inefficient but could go on forever so in this case if we're representing people and their best friends um, we might have a group of three three people where jess's best friend is tom tom's is, is kate and kate's is jess's and if we're if we're storing information about people and who their best friend is in this way this list would go on forever because there's it, it has circular references right so these are both problems that we want to solve. So we, we need some way to, to handle references with um, serialization that doesn't create these problems. The, the simplest way to do this, or, or what you might have thought of, is, is to actually split up the data into, into two different classes of objects and use references. So in this case, taking the very first example where I had two people with the same hometown, what I can do is give them list what their hometown is by hometown ID so in this case both Jess and Jonah are from hometown number one and then we have a separate object a separate list I guess um, or data structure that stores all the different hometowns exactly once so this is like denormalizing the data in a sense we have two different tables of data essentially where one refers to the other to use a relational database terminology all right so this is efficient uh, and it's a good approach um, that also can work for the circular references right if we if we have a person id instead of actually printing out the details of the of the best friend we just print their best friend an id right so we we end up basically printing out uh, a graph with with a kind of an adjacent uh, showing who, who each person is connected to in terms of best friend and um when we read this later we can we can tr we'll translate that into the circularly referenced uh, network um, 
Uh, yeah, so so do you see any downsides of using references here? What, what could go wrong when we're using references um, in serialization? Stop and think about that. Well, it just makes things a little bit more complicated. That's the main problem I, I see here. So when you're going through your data, like if all you have in your in memory is is a list of people with their information, you have to actually go through first to figure out, okay, what are all the hometowns and then store those before you store the people with the home and then you know, define the hometown IDs and then store those in place of the original hometowns. So on the producer side, there's more work. On the consumer side, there's also more work because uh, you have to like load all these hometowns first or somehow refer to them later on when you see the, uh, the ID of a hometown. So like you might need uh, more than one pass through the data or, or just in general, it's more complicated. So with REST, we're using HTTP uh, to do something different than what HTTP was originally designed for. Uh, you might wonder why we're doing that. Because HTTP is not, it's not a super simple uh, protocol. It does have a fair amount of complexity. And like you saw all those headers uh, in, in some of the sample requests, which probably looked confusing to you. Um, so you might wonder why we bother with all that stuff. Well, basically the reason is that, that the complexity that's there is there for a reason in the sense that it implements certain features that are that were originally designed for web uh, browsing but actually are quite nice for arbitrary client server applications. So things like encryption, compression, uh, proxying and caching, response codes, those are all things that we, could, we actually would like in our applications and we get that for free if we use HTTP. Like encryption is a huge one. Um, although I guess we could also use TLS with separately from HTTP, um, but still, you know, that we get that very easily with HTTP by using HTTPS. Programming languages already have HTTP clients, and, and also server frameworks are very popular. So, like, I guess the very popularity of HTTP has made it a standard and made it, made, made it very easy to use and very uh, featureful. Um, so th those are the advantages of using HTTP and why we 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 use. Uh, REST, why REST is a, is a good choice and why it's kind of like become popular and, and cause, you know it's easy to use because HTTP is, 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 a, is a, everywhere and has all these features built in. So if you want to implement a REST API all you have to do is use some kind of um, web server framework and have code that handles the different URL paths. Instead of returning HTML for web pages you're going to return the appropriate responses that your REST API defines. There are some disadvantages, though. It's not all uh, rosy and sunshine. Uh, there's a little. You might get more complexity than you really need because HTTP does have a few complexities. You might get some unexpected behaviors because of those complexities, like caching, for example. You might not realize that there's caching that's happening, and therefore you see update out of date responses. HTTP is a human readable protocol, which is good in some sense for debugging, but also makes it a little bit inefficient. And also, if you're using HTTP, you have to think in terms of, you have to make it work with the HTTP methods and paths. So in other words, you have to sort of think in a RESTful way, and, and a RESTful style for an interface is not really, um, doesn't match every app, applications that are not oriented toward data. I would say applications that are more action-oriented are harder to fit into the HTTP, like get, post, put, delete uh, style. There are some more efficient network API formats. Uh, Thrift and protocol buffers are examples. These do not build on top of HTTP, and they end up creating much smaller and more space efficient messages. Um, the downside of that is that those messages are not human readable. Uh, there's also there's less processing on both sides because it doesn't have all the HTTP features uh, and all the possible headers that HTTP has. So what you do when you're using thrift and protocol buffers is uh, there are specific tools that come with those that let you specify your API. I usually define them with a language that's very similar to defining a function interface. So you have like uh, the name of the function, the type of what's returned, and then a list of the different named parameters and what the types are of the, of the input. So you def it's more like writing code than it is um, designing uh, like a, a REST API. And then those functions are translated into a library that you can use uh, in your code to call through the API. So 
like when you're using something like thrift and protocol buffers, you're not like constructing the requests yourself more d directly. Rather, you use usually a library that is generated from a configuration file. Um, whereas with REST, you are working at pretty close to the network level to directly construct the network the messages. Again, what that means is that it's it's REST is less efficient, but it's more human readable, easier to debug, easier to understand what's happening because you're actually controlling directly what is being sent in the requests. So you can look at the requests more easily and figure out what's what's wrong with them if there is something wrong. Yeah. But so for most applications, uh, message complexity is not a primary concern, but developer productivity is more important and therefore that's why REST is used and also it's standard. So it's, it's um, uh, it, it's a good choice for third-party APIs where you want other developers to use your system and, and you're not, you can't really know really what well, language they want to use or, or anything like that. Okay, so today we talked about uh, REST APIs and data serialization. Uh, the services we've been talking about so far uh, can be thought of as black boxes if what we expose is a network API that defines what, what the format is of the messages that go in and what the format is of the responses that come out. So this, the benefit of this is that it, it like allows you to treat your, your service as a black box so the outside could be de developed separately of the inside. You can have a third party developers interact with your system. Um, a network API defines the format and meaning of your requests and responses to allow that interoperability between different teams in the same company or like you know different organizations entirely. Uh, developers you've, you've never met using your data or your service. REST is the most popular format for network APIs and it's 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 the way of building an API that most resembles HTTP and um, therefore uses URLs methods, response codes, and typically there are JSON bodies. JSON is used for the, the big data that, that's included in the request and get returned back in the responses. JSON is the, is the most common data serialization format for APIs. XML is also used to a lesser extent and, and more in the old days, um, but um, you may also see that. Okay, uh, next time we'll talk about microservices, which uh, takes this idea of network APIs and which you know you need network APIs to build microservices but we'll talk a little bit about why you want to break up a system into little pieces um, and when you maybe when you would not want to do that and what the pros and cons are and how that um, affects your uh, design and deployment processes. All right see you later.